I like figuring out how things work, and then making videos explaining the things that I've learned to hopefully entertain and inspire you. We've been slowly building up a community of like-minded people over at Discord, and someone suggested I look at Michelin Rally Masters, a somewhat obscure racing game from the early 2000s, made by none other than DICE, before they were acquired by EA. Apparently it has a host of issues running on modern Windows, which normally makes for an interesting problem to solve. That being said, and somewhat of a spoiler, the issues were quite deep-rooted and a much larger commitment than I anticipated. However, rather than focusing on my lack of skill and time management, there was one interesting thing that I discovered that I wanted to share with you, the game's DRM. That's right, it's another DRM defeat video. I've acquired the game from an abandoned website and thrown it into a VM as I trust a rando XE from the internet, as about as far as I can throw it. I've installed it, and which one do I want? Rally Lobby, Rally Masters, or Rally Multi? Lobby and Multi look like multiplayer, so Masters it is. And nothing works. There's a helpful readme with a typo. Did I write this? I've run the game under Proc1 to try and get an idea of what it's doing, and it seems to try and read in the whole disk and then crashes... question mark? Time to take a closer look at this under the hood. Using a debugger, we can see it's crashing in a function called calldll, which sounds like a custom function, from something called rlm32lib.dll, which is shipped with the game. calldll does a jump to some global variable that is unset when the game loads. Ah, looks like it's set here when the game runs. But the code it jumps to is nonsense, so probably obfuscated. I've set a hardware breakpoint on this address so the debugger will stop when it gets written to, and it's hit here. Seems to load in 8 bytes and then does something to that to get the next bytes? Where does it come from? Where does it go? It does some lookup based on this function and a global table here. Looks like it uses this table to decide when to read and when to write, so it's probably encoding which parts of the binary to deobfuscate. It also goes through this function, which does a lot of bit shifting, which feels deobfuscation-y. So I've done what any normal person would do, and I've copied the assembly into a C++ program and fudged it a bit to run. It actually gets the same output as the real game, so it's just a case now of plumbing it into the earlier table to recover everything. However, I will admit this is a bit of a faff, and not really getting us any closer to our end goal. So I cheated a bit, I ran the game again, and then when it crashed I just dumped the library, and this is after all the deobfuscation and therefore allowed me to bypass a lot of the misery. An interesting string has now manifested itself. Laser lock. This is another classic DRM solution that does funny things to the disk in order to prevent copying software from making a true copy. So doing some digging, it looks like the call DLL is part of the laser lock protection, but what is it doing? There's over 500 references to this function in the game, so my gut feeling is that it's obfuscating function calls. Let's step through the first call to this function. We go over some knobs and then what looks like some hand-rolled assembly and hit this function. After this call, EAX has the address of get version, which is a very common first function to call in a Win32 program. So my theory now is that this is used to obfuscate Win32 function calls, which is why there's so many of them. The problem now is that this only works for resolving the first function, or the other calls return bad addresses, which presumably they don't when it runs normally. Also, setting breakpoints within this blob causes it to stop working, so presumably some anti-debug techniques going on. This will make debugging the game a lot more difficult if the DRM is checking for the presence of a debugger. I've been trying to figure out how the DRM knows which functions to return, as looking at all the call DLL's call sites, it doesn't pass any additional arguments. In fact, it looks like this call was a straight replacement for the original, so probably tool automated. I've stared at it a bit, and I think I figured it out. The internal function which does the resolution is passed one argument, the return address of the original function call, so it must be using that as some sort of lookup. Then, at the end of the function, it replaces the return address with the new function. So the game calls call DLL with all the arguments it needs for the original function, it then looks up what that function should be based on where it was called from, and then returns into that as if it was never there. Cute. The resolution function looks complicated, but does have a string which supports our theory. Address not found in table, program will crash. Okay, let's have a look. It uses set timer, which suggests it's got some timing based anti-debugging checks, i.e. if it takes too long to execute something, it'll assume you're stepping through it with a debugger. This set time call is in an if guarded by a global variable. This results in the timer not being called on the first pass through this function, but it will be called on all future ones. Maybe this is why we can only resolve the first function. Just thinking about it, we got kind of lucky that we could observe the first call DLL resolving to the correct function. If it hadn't done that, then it would be a lot more work just to get to where we are now. Anyway. After the timing call, it checks another global to see if it should call another function, which looks like it's checking the game is installed. 
actually it does different things depending on this flag which it increments at the end of each call until it hits 300. At the end of the function there's this check which checks if some variable is less than ox 23c or 572. Now there's only, only, 571 calls to this function in the game, so this must be some sort of limit check. Wait, yes, if we follow through the failing case we see it will display a message box with our address not found in table string. I think it keeps a counter of how many functions it's deobfuscated and does different checks based on that. I've also found what looks an awful lot like a debug function and it's checking for the presence of debug files. If I create both of these then the screen freaks out, however if I just create this one then I get some logging. I think one of the checks it's doing must be for the CD. If I mount the ISO and run the game, I get ntcd found in the logs. Then it spins for a bit, printing ntrd underscore. Then we get ntcd underscore sign not found, as well as star star as star star underscore star as and not found star. Annoyingly, the dump doesn't have any references to these strings, so it's hard to narrow down what code is failing, but presumably it's doing some bespoke check for whatever shenanigans laser lock has done to the CD. I wonder if this is why it replaces so many Win32 function calls. It's probably less to impede reverse engineering and more just to guarantee that the CD checks get called with relative frequency. Anyway, I brought a copy from eBay. Guess this is an unboxing video now. Oh. <coughs> God, stinks of stale tobacco. Oh, oh. Anyway, and it seems to start okay in the VM with the disk. I wonder if we can strip the DRM from the game. If we can resolve all the call DLL function calls, then we can just patch the binary to make the real function calls again. Then none of the disk check or anti debugging code will ever get run. So ultimately, the problem we have now is that we need to resolve all of these 500 odd function calls, but we can't just set EIP to a function call and then set a breakpoint after the resolution function and pull the result out, because the game can detect that and will just give us a bad address. Luckily, there's another type of breakpoint we can use. Normally, when you set a breakpoint in a debugger, it silently inserts a special one byte instruction, OXCC, one of my favourites. When the CPU executes this, it will inform the kernel that a breakpoint has been hit, and then the kernel will see if there's a debugger attached to the current program, and then inform that. So this is how the game is probably detecting the breakpoints. It'll be periodically scanning the memory, looking for the special one byte instruction. This is known as a software breakpoint, but there's also a hardware breakpoint, which we actually used earlier. I've set a hardware breakpoint on this address so the debugger will stop when it gets written to. X64 has four special registers that you can slap an address into. Then, depending on how you configure it, the CPU will raise an interrupt if these addresses are read, written, or executed. These don't affect the memory of the process and are therefore slightly harder to detect. So as a trial run, let's pick a random call DLL, force EIP to be at that point, and then set a hardware breakpoint after the resolution function. Bosh. Now I don't know about you, but I have very little desire to do this manually 570 times, so let's automate it. I've built a little launcher in C++ that will start the game but in a suspended state. Windows is surprisingly liberal with its API. We can use virtual alloc x to allocate some memory into the suspended process, and then write into that the name of a DLL. We can then spin up a new thread in that process and cause it to execute load library from that string we just smashed into it, and then resume the program. So if you bring all this together and build a little payload DLL that writes to a file, we can easily start the game and have it execute code we control all in our own thread. So we scan the game for all occurrences of call DLL, suspend the main thread, and then set EIP to one of them. We can also set hardware breakpoints by setting these special register flags. But how do we handle the hardware breakpoint being hit if we're not running under a debugger? Internally, Windows will raise an exception in the process, so if we register something called a vectored exception handler, then we can essentially provide a callback for these hardware breakpoints. When we detect one, we log it, and then move on to the next. There seems to be some instability when running this, and it just stops working after a while. So I now just run it in batches of 10. So when the game is finished, I kill it, and then start again. Okay, I've resolved all the functions, but because I'm careless, I didn't store these in any useful format. I've just dumped them into the logs. I don't really want to run this again as it's not quick, so I've just written some Python to pass out the logs and then patch the program. And it crashes. Looking at the crash site, the stack was all messed up, so back to the real game and forcing the execution to the offending call DLL call, we can see something interesting. 
There's actually two paths out of this code. Most of these functions end in a call, but a select few end in a jump. So we need to log which one of these exit paths is taken and then call the resolve function with either a call or a jump instruction. Let's play this game again. Okay, so this actually works. We can now progress through to some other unrelated crash. It's not a true no CD crack as the game still tries to load some files off the disk, but if we copy those locally and fudge the assembly, then we can remove the need for the disk. So it crashes on direct input create X, which is the direct X API for joystick or game controller input. Now, normally I don't look at any prior art when doing this, but I did look up the game's entry in PC gaming wiki. One, the assertion that it uses a simple CD check seems a bit of a simplification. Two, there are some known fixes for these issues, including the crash detailed on Discord. These involved using shimmed versions of various DirectX libraries. Honestly, each of these are massive projects in and of themselves and would require way more time than I have to recreate. So I sent all my findings over to the chap on Discord and I hope you can get the game running. Hopefully that wasn't too anticlimactic. If you want to see how I actually fix games that don't work on modern versions of Windows, then you'll want to check out this next video.